Hey, hey, hope you are doing great. We are in it to win it, my friends. Beautiful. Hey, I'm just going to uh, tag you guys in here. Look, I can see that we are live in the group, which is fantastic. I can see you guys starting to jump on. Welcome, welcome. Um, as you jump on, let me know what you've been learning, what's been standing out, and how's the vibe in your part of the world? What's the time? Where are you checking in from? I got the crew checking in here. I can see New Zealand, South Africa, Australia uh, jumping in. I can see others jumping in. Drop in the comments where you are jumping in from, where you're coming live from. What an absolute honor it is. Uh, Cambodia, whoop, whoop. Amazing drop where you are uh, coming in from. It's a real delight and a, a true delight and privilege to be with you guys. Um, why don't you go ahead and tag your friends as well uh, in this live stream. Tag them. Just make sure that no one misses out. If you've got friends, family, people that you want to live a limitless life, but they haven't jumped into this group yet, then uh, send them a link to jump on in. Um, post our people. If you're doing this with your friends, tell them, hey, it's live. Help them get into the group if for any reason they're struggling to get in. Um, I just want to make sure that no one misses out on the goodness. So as, we, as we're about to light this up, I'm going to pray in just a second, but um, why don't you, again, just put in the comments what's standing out, what value are you getting, what's changing, what's God doing, what's God saying, what dreams are coming alive, what's happening on the inside of you. Chuck that in the comments and then after the session as well, just post a, you know, like a quick post in here about what God's doing, give some testimonies, share some encouragement. It really lights us all up. We rise together, the atmosphere builds together as we just share in what God's doing in all of our hearts, uh, which is very, very cool. Um, hey, uh, can someone also please just share the live link for this into the chat? Um, that we've created about this in this group here. Um, let me see if I can see it. Here we go. Um, oh, here we go. Boom, there we go, got it. Okay, fam, we are all in. I'm going to pray. Why don't you pray with me as we... Uh, get into this beautiful session today. <sighs> okay, Papa, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the sacred gift that you have given us of life. <laughs> thank you for the sacred gift of today. Thank you that today is an absolute, uh, Lord, it's an absolute treasure. And we ask that you give us the grace to steward today. Um, Lord, in a sense that we would have a sense of significance about today as though it was our last, that we would have such a treasure in our heart towards the people that we connect with, towards uh, our relationship with you, towards uh, every whisper that you bring into our hearts and every assignment that you've placed on our lives. And we say, we love you. And we want to give you all the glory and all the honor. And we ask that you would release, Lord, a rare grace on our lives to turn our lives into a masterpiece for your glory. We ask that you would give it, Lord, you'd put a special grace on us. You'd put a rare anointing on us to turn our lives into a masterpiece for your glory. Jesus, we say we thank you, uh, we love you, we bless you, and we give you all the glory and all the honor for every good thing that's happening in our lives. 
I just thank you for, even just now, I have such a, a sense of the sweetness and the nearness and the beauty of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for a fresh move in our hearts right now. I sense the freshness and the tenderness and the loving kindness of your Spirit breathing on us, blowing on us, moving on us right now. And I thank you for the awakening of dreams that's taking place. I can see <laughs> a dream revival happening right now. I can see dreams. I just see all these eggs and dreams that had never uh, been hatched before that actually are dormant in your spirit, dormant in your heart. I can see all these dreams beginning to hatch, beginning to come alive <laughs> as divine alignment snaps into place in your body, soul, spirit, your heart, and your mind, as shalom comes upon you, I declare shalom, shalom, everything functioning according to divine design in your life, in Jesus' name, whoa, ho, ho, ho. oh, Papa, shalom, shalom, would you breathe divine alignment, wow, would you, uh, and Lord, we want to be those who uh, are, willing to say do whatever it takes in us leave no stone unturned in us would you baptize us with your love and your fire in a way that consumes everything in us that can be consumed so that only christ would remain we give you all the glory we give you all the honor we lay our lives down for you may they be a masterpiece for your glory Amen. Oh, fam, how are you doing? Oh, I see this. I love this comment here. I love drink, drinking from his river of delight in the comments. Um, Papa, I just thank you as well. Uh, fresh joy, uh, fresh peace, fresh ecstasies, fresh bliss, fresh wonder from heaven, swallowing us up, wrapping us up in Jesus' name. Ah, fam, I love you. Uh, it's such an honor to be here, and I'm so so grateful to uh, be able to have today with you and to have today. Today is such a gift. And uh, I want to start with a couple of stories. Have you heard the story of uh, Michelangelo when he carved the angel David? Uh, sorry, when he sorry, when he carved the angel. So he carved this amazing angel, right? It took him uh, well over a year of constant chiseling this big um, big marble boulder. And at the end of it, when he'd when he'd finished creating this absolute masterpiece, it's one of the, you know, like just one of the world's most treasured pieces of art, he said, I saw an angel in the marble and I carved until I set it free. <laughs> I saw an angel in the marble and I carved until I set it free. Now that angel that he saw in the marble, did he look at the marble and just right there in the marble, um, the marble looked like angel and the marble had little lines on it? No, he was seeing in the spirit. His heart was dreaming. His heart was alive and he was seeing an angel in the spirit. And that's what you get to do. That's how you live your wildest dreams is you let your heart Free and you see the angel in the marble. This is your masterpiece. This is your gift to God. This is your gift to your family. This is your gift to humanity. This is the legacy you will leave. What is the masterpiece? And today is such a rich treasure for all of us because today, right? Today we have the opportunity to create our masterpiece. And I want to suggest to you that we are invited to create masterpieces out of our life and especially on two fronts right uh, we're invited to create a masterpiece out of ourselves and who we personally become uh, in our in us as an individual we are becoming a masterpiece and then there's the dreams and the assignments and the calling that God's given us which are also becoming a masterpiece um I got another, another couple of stories up my sleeve that I wanted to just to share with you, just kind of inspire you a little bit. But um, who has heard of uh, Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf? A lot of you guys will have heard of Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Well, he was looking at a piece of art, right? Who out there are, are our artists, our creators, our creatives? Um, 
you know, just drop that in the comment. If you're one of the, if you're like, man, I love to write and just drop in there. What do you love to create? I mean, everyone loves to create in some form, but just drop in the comments. What do you love to create? What do you, are you like, man, I come alive when I'm creating this and Hey, maybe you're a builder. Maybe you're not like a painter, but maybe you're someone who like, you know, I love to build. I love to landscape. Whatever you love to create, drop it down there. Maybe you like to create atmospheres. Maybe you like to create gatherings where people connect whatever it is, what do you love to create? Just drop that in the comments. So um, Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf was looking at a painting and this painting just stirred him to the core to go all in and give his life, really lay his life down for Jesus. As he was staring at it, as he was deeply meditating on it, something about that painting just resonated and he thought, I want to give my life like just in a deep, deep way. And not long after that, he actually started to have the opportunity because there was a group of people called the Moravians, and they were actually uh, Christian refugees. They were being persecuted by the church. What a surprise, you know, when there's a new move of God, the old move of God so often persecutes it. And that's what happened to the Moravians. They um, they were believing for the more of God, right? Who's ever believed for the more or wanted more and then been persecuted by your religious community uh, because they're like, hey, no, all we've got is this. And, and so they were persecuted. They fled. They were um, basically, they actually literally had to flee their country and they became refugees and they ended up on the estate of Count Ludwig, Ludwig von Zinzendorf in Hernhut, Germany. Anyway, what ended up happening is they started praying one night and a move of God really began to stir and they decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pray 24-7. So they started a prayer meeting that lasted over a hundred years years how beautiful is that right they started a prayer meeting that lasted over a hundred years and that story that i shared with you yesterday yesterday about john leonard dover uh, who sold himself into uh into slavery to reach the slaves in the west indies well he was their first missionary and actually some of the money that was raised from him selling himself into slavery actually donated to start the uh, the missions fund for the Moravians. Now, what a lot of people don't know about that story is that uh, John Leonard Nova and I think David was his companion. They went to the West Indies when they got there. Um, they said to him, "Hey, these guys, hey, yo, you can live in the house. You know, you can, you know, you you don't have to be with all the other slaves. You know, like." you know, you're educated, all these things. And they eventually turned that down and said, no, put us out with the slaves. So they went out with the slaves, but here's what happened. They sparked a move of God and over 30,000 uh, of those slaves in the West Indies gave their lives to Jesus in this wild move of God. Eventually they did actually uh, come back, return to their families and become part of the leadership of the Moravian movement, but the Moravian movement, as a result, sparked an entire move of God uh, with this prayer meeting, and actually following on from their prayer meeting, uh, there was awakening that shot across Europe, there was awakening that shot across America, uh, the world was changed, the world, you know, um, it was John Wesley, it was Moravians that actually really led him to his first real deep encounter with God, and just set him on fire, and he sparked such a move of God in England. It's just, there's just person after person whose lives were impacted by the Moravians. Now, this is compounding returns, okay? This is the power that you carry when you create a masterpiece out of your life. Uh, you know, your Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf, he was like, I want to create a masterpiece. What could happen if you, one, decided, if you desired, and if you committed to say, God, I want to create a masterpiece out of my out of me. I want I want to become a masterpiece for your glory. And I want my life to serve you, to serve others, to be a masterpiece that serves humanity and blesses others. You're working on two masterpieces, the masterpiece of who you are becoming to give glory to God. You know, you're actually uh, awakening to the present reality of who you are made perfectly in his image. Here's the third story. Uh, this is a you know, personal story for me. I was, It was 2008. I was in Bangkok in Thailand. I was leading a five-month mission trip. There was four of us, myself and three friends, and we had been serving a ministry called Nightlight, um, amazing ministry in Bangkok, Thailand. And while we were there, uh, we were out. Um, we we're out on the streets in Bangkok and. Uh, thousands and thousands of prostitutes all around us and they're not just thousands of prostitutes there was 
what, what we heard when we're sitting there and hearing the stories of what was actually uh, happening as we listen to the missionaries telling us the behind the scenes, they said, look, nearly anywhere you go here, if you ask the right person, they'll be able to bring you out a kid or a baby. And I was just like getting rocked by this, but there was so much more happening around us. Um, Thailand is right on the border of Burma or Myanmar, which is a military dictatorship and there's ethnic cleansing happening there. We'd been listening to the testimonies of people where the government army had come through, burnt down their village, shot uh, people, caught their women. And, you know, we'd, we'd listen to the testimonies of people whose wives and children, you know, they'd raped their wives and they'd tied them up and thrown them into, this is like a trigger alert. And I'm, I'm sorry for this, you know, like brace yourself. This is pretty real stuff. This is something that rocked me to the core. So if you need to switch off if it's going to get scary just you know, just brace yourself but listen they they were burning they just burned them alive those families and you know the fathers had watched their whole families being thrown to the fire by the government army and burned alive as this ethnic cleansings uh going on through uh myanmar and as a result with this war this ethnic cleansing the price of life was so cheap you could buy kids or babies for 10 new zealand dollars um, on the border, you know, it's like the price of a burger, you could buy a child or a baby. And so that was happening. And we'd seen that and we'd seen all this human trafficking, we're seeing poverty over here on this trip. And we'd heard, hey, if you know, if, you know, you got to be real careful if you do get uh, into this human trafficking thing, because if you go to the police, you're likely to end up in their trafficking syndicate because the police were running their own uh, human trafficking syndicates the politicians were on the take and they were corrupt and they had their own brothels in the red light districts um we were in one village where the day that we got there uh or the day before a whole bunch of kids were were taken this is again another real trigger alert but there was a little boy I don't know what happened. No one knows the actual full, full story, but there was just the body of this little boy. He was left there and they'd taken his heart for the organ trade. And we were just surrounded by just chaos, uh, chaos stories, heartbreaking stories, just getting a battering with all of this reality, right? All of what was reality for them was getting culture shock battering. I'm like, ah, oh God, and I'm trying to process it. And now all of a sudden I hear that, you know, uh, we're actually sitting in a place that's a pedophile hub for pedophiles all around the world to come and have uh, crazy fantasies fulfilled. I'm just like, ah, oh, this is terrible. So we're in the, you know, we were staying that night. I'm just like, I'm praying, I'm seeking God. I'm like, oh, my heart's just getting wrecked in that place. I'm like, oh my gosh, God, I didn't know how to process. It was just getting too much. And actually I started getting overwhelmed and I couldn't see, uh, I couldn't see hope right? I actually came and they're trying to process it and trying to say, hey, how does, how do we see change in nations? How do we see change? Came to a point where I actually just reached a place of despair and my heart couldn't see the hope in the midst of the circumstance and situation. It was just after that place where my heart hit that place of despair that God spoke into my heart, spoke into me, and he, uh, he gave me a picture in that moment of an army rising up, right? This army, uh, it's the family of God carrying the presence of God, carrying the love of God, carrying the power of God, walking in intimacy, walking in sonship, walking in dominion, walking as giant slayers, walking as those who have the capacity to outdream darkness and redesign reality. And everywhere they turned, they were bringing down the giants of darkness. And these giants of darkness had been intimidating me, uh, just, just tormenting me with the sense that you are absolutely insignificant and as I listened to them I'd gone to that place of despair and this vision from heaven hit me and boom something exploded something deep on the inside of me exploded and I was like wow there is hope and listen it brought me to a place of decision right a place of decision where like I'm giving my life to see an army raised up for God to bring down the giants of darkness and to disciple nations. And in that moment, he spoke to me, and this is my Bible. And it's, um, you know, even like, it's so, it was so profound that that was 2007 It's 2023 now. And my Bible is still marked. This is the, this is the page uh, that's always marked in every Bible I've had ever since. And it's this Jeremiah one, the, verse four, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, 
Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I've put my words in your mouth. Now, verse 10, this is the one that just burns in me to the core. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to tear down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build, and to plant. <laughs> um, wow, brought me to the place of decision where I, I said with my whole heart, whatever it takes, God, whatever it takes, I'm, I'm all in devotion. There's nothing held back. I'll do whatever it takes to lay my life down, to give my life to this cause, to bring down the giants of darkness and to see nations discipled and to serve you in raising up this army that can accomplish your heart's desire in the earth. Ooh, I'd love you just to say decision, right? Decision. What's it going to take you? Right? What's it going to take for you to come to a point of decision where you're going to say, God, whatever it takes. You know, I mentioned yesterday, uh, you know, in one of the previous sessions, what does it, what does it really cost to be a follower of Jesus? Um, you're saying yes to Jesus and, and saying yes to salvation. Maybe you say yes in, a, in, a, in an altar call, right? That costs you nothing. Um, and then it'll cost you something to, uh, it'll cost you something to follow Jesus for a while, right? It'll cost you, it'll cost you something to start that process of sanctification, start, you know, uh, laying down a few things, but then purification, that, that place of like where you, you're going to actually live in the fullness. It'll cost you the one thing you're not willing to pay until you're willing to pay it all. It's a place of total surrender. <laughs> and it's in that place of total surrender. When you say, yes, God, you come to that place of total surrender, that's in that moment there that you begin to be like Michelangelo. We like, I saw an angel in the marble and I carved until I set it free. You, you begin to see a masterpiece. You begin to create a masterpiece that's greater than anything you've seen before, desired before, imagined before. So in our session today, what I want to really hone in on is uh, what are you willing to pay? You know, and uh, we're going to be looking at the curriculum for a limitless life and asking ourselves, hey, are we ready to go all in to actually subscribe, to genuinely unsubscribe from the curriculum around us? This is Romans 12 too. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. The, the pattern of this world is all around us. It's in us, right? It's in our, our, our conscious, our subconscious, our unconscious. We don't know. We don't even realize how deep this is in us. It's all around us. It's our education system. It's our family tradition. That's in our own parenting. It's in, uh, it's in our churches. It's everywhere. Are we ready to unsubscribe from the pattern of this world? And listen, you can tell it's the pattern of this world. Let me give you a little way to figure out if it's the pattern of this world. If it's not producing consistently, if it's not consistently producing the Ephesians 3.20 lifestyle, it's the pattern of this world. If it's not consistently producing the Ephesians 3.20 lifestyle, it's the pattern of this world. <laughs> Why? How can, I, how can I say that? Listen, before... <laughs> Jeremiah 1 that we just looked at, so, you know, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. <laughs> before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before, I, <laughs> before you were born, I set you apart. And listen, I want you to imagine this with me for a moment. Just imagine the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and here they are before time begins, before the foundation of the world. 
and destiny is what God saw when he unleashed his limitless power to dream the best for you. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they are unleashing as they uh, as they began to you know, dream for the destiny of people's lives. And they're unleashing absolute limitless as they go, wow, this is, this is what I'm dreaming for this person. And this is what we're dreaming for this person. And this is what we're dreaming for this person. And listen, every single one on the, you know, on the production line is five star. Every single one is top shelf. Every single one is the best of the best. Every single one is glorious. Every single one, every destiny that they're dreaming of is absolutely phenomenal. Wow. It's just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then they get to you. And when they got to you, they didn't go, ah, oh, and have a dud. When they got to you, it was heaven's finest unleashed it was the greatest most beautiful most glorious destiny that they'd ever conceived and you have a five-star royal calling a five-star royal assignment on your life there's no one who has an assignment on their life that is more significant than the assignment that is on your life uh, I love to think about this sometimes is listen, how would how would you be living if you got the assignment that Mary got? <laughs> how would you be living if there was a knock on the door one day and it's Mary and she said, Look, I've got to shoot off for a few years. I'm tapping you in. You've got to raise Jesus. <laughs> if you if you had that moment where all of a sudden Jesus was left on your doorstep, say he's like four months old, um, Tobias, my son, it's his first birthday today. How exciting. Um, imagine that Jesus is four months old. He's dropped off at your doorstep and they're like, look, you're tapping in. He's all yours. How would you, <laughs> can you imagine that? This, listen, the assignment on your life is no less significant than the assignment on Mary's life when she was given the assignment to raise Jesus. The assignment on your life is no less significant than the assignment on Moses's life. The assignment on your life is no less significant than the assignment on David's life, on Paul's life, on Daniel's life, on Deborah's life, on Esther's life. It's the exact same level of significance. It's a five-star royal calling. That is the level of significance on your life. And listen, here's, here's the trick, right? It's not that your life isn't significant. It's that you've misperceived how significant your life is. If you had realized how significant your life is, oh my gosh, uh, things would start changing and rearranging. Do you realize that you have the, that there's no one on the planet who has an assignment on their life more significant than you. You're it. You're the top of the food chain in terms of the level of significance and calling that has ever been dished out to humanity. See, it's not the issue that we have is not that, hey, your one person is more important or another person is more important. That, there, that doesn't exist. It's not a thing. The issue that we have is getting trapped in comparisons and, and just playing these mind games where we've actually lost sight of the truth of how significant you are and how significant I am. Holy moly family, you are as significant as it gets. You're as significant as Samuel. Oh, you are as significant, significant as, you know, as Sarah and as Abraham. You're as significant as Reinhard Bonke. You're as significant as, uh, as John Wimber, as Catherine Kuhlman, uh, you know, you name it, you are as significant as them. And as if, if you will start to change your mindset and start to realize, oh my gosh, God has singled me out for the most significant calling that I could possibly ever walk in. I better set myself apart. I better set myself apart for the sacred, holy calling. I'm as significant as Mary raising Jesus. Oh my gosh. If Jesus was dropped off on your door, would things change? Would you sharpen up your household? Would you sharpen up your discipline? Would you go, well, things have to change. Jesus is in the house. <laughs> oh my gosh. So fam, for us, today is significant beyond measure. How would you structure today if you knew you were looking after Jesus for the day? If Jesus was being dropped off, and you knew you were going to have Jesus for the day. How, like, would you be taking a little bit more attention to detail? Would there be a little bit more care? Would there be a little bit more planning? Would there be a little bit more like, well, I've got to turn up and burn up. I've got to be here. I've got to be fully present. I've got to go all in today. I've got Jesus to look after. Holy moly. 
but that was like what it was like for Mary every day. So guys, when we start to grasp significance of who we are and what God's called us to do, things start changing. We start stepping into that Michelangelo space, right? This space of creating masterpieces, this space of genius. Now there is that that's who you are. You are a genius. You're a, you're a person who creates masterpieces. This is what you do all day long. I don't care who you are or where you are. Listen, if you understand your calling, what you'll be doing every single day is you'll be creating masterpieces every day, a masterpiece of your own life and a masterpiece out of every dream and assignment that God has called you to engage in. Whoa, you're creating masterpieces. I saw an angel in the marble and I carved until I set it free. That's what you're doing every day. Every single action that you take from the moment you wake up till the moment you fall asleep, bold, passionate, precise, strategic actions every single day, which are bringing your wildest dreams to life and unleashing you to be the greatest expression of who you truly are. Oh, guys, I'm getting a little bit excited about this. Let me know if you're excited about that. Let me know if you are significant. Just drop significant in the comments because that's who you truly are. Now, we are caught in a culture surrounded by average, surrounded by people uh, not doing that. And they, listen, in the midst of this being who you truly are, there is a very, very real satanic assignment against each one of our lives to ensure. Now, this might sound offensive, but when has ever, whenever has Satan, you know, had a had a good intention? He doesn't have a good intention. He has pure evil intentions for your life, and this is it to make you weak-willed, lazy, and stupid. All right, he wants to make you weak-willed, lazy. And stupid. That's Satan's assignment against your life. He wants to make you so weak willed, lazy, and stupid that you fit in with average, all right? That you fit in with a woke, broke culture, that you fit in uh, with, with an absolute tragic culture. He wants you to fit in with average everywhere you go. He doesn't want you to rock the boat. He wants you, ah, uh, yeah. Just living that average life, subscribing to the pattern of this world. He doesn't want you stepping out of this pattern of this world and you know, Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. That word transformed in the Greek is the Greek word metamorpho, right? It's used four times in the New Testament, twice when Jesus transfigured, once in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, where it says we are all transfigured into his image from one degree of glory to another. And then in Romans 12, 2, the correct translation is uh, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed figured by the renewing of your your mind right this is the limitless space that we're called into and so it's time for us to unsubscribe from that curriculum and subscribe to the curriculum of a limitless life let me just drop limitless if you're ready to just go all in and pay a price and let me ask you what are you willing to pay to subscribe to the curriculum of a limitless life now so at this point i want to show you a couple of pictures okay I want to show you a couple of pictures of um, of some Shaolin monk children, okay? Shaolin monk children. Drop Shaolin. It's S-H-A-O-L-I-M. Uh, N, I think. N. N for naughty. Shaolin monk ninjas. Right, we're going to look at them for a moment because, listen, the the, the, the satanic assignment right, is to make you weak-willed, lazy, and stupid. How crazy is that? Weak-willed, lazy, and stupid. Um, Satan wants you to be a, you know, woke, <laughs> broke, lazy, uh, you know, person who's just not living their dreams. Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Let me just, do you want to be uh, a woke broke sluggard is that what you want or not like just does that disgust you do you hate that to me that's the type of thing that i'm like mm, I, I hate i hate that idea let's go beyond that so let me share i'm going to do a screen share and i'm going to share with you a couple of pictures just to try and help jolt our mindset as to where we are going to have to go to subscribe to a uh, limitless life right okay Here we go. Um, I'm having one chance at this, and if I can't find these images, they might have disappeared. I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pull a couple of images up for you online. My other images have disappeared. So 
you can do the same thing, okay? Shaolin kids, monk, that'll do it, okay? And just jump on here, click on images. You can watch the videos if you want. And what I'm specifically wanting you to see is the level of focus and discipline, okay? So say focus and discipline. Look at these kids. Look, look at this. Holy moly. What the heck is going on? Um, look at this kid, right? These kids are like nine years old. Look at this guy. Holy moly. They get up at 5 a.m. in the morning uh, to, to practice being Shaolin monks. And they train for this their whole life to become Shaolin masters, right? They train for this their whole life. From the, this kid is three years old. He gets up at 5 a.m. every morning to train. Look at these guys. Holy. Now, say focus and discipline, right? Focus and discipline. All right, I'm going to stop the screen share there. If we want to subscribe to the limitless life, things are going to have to change for us in some pretty significant ways. Um, one of them is focus and discipline, okay? Because the, the level of focus and discipline that we're used to is the level of focus and discipline that produces, right? It produces average. Uh, it produces that it's the, it's the mindset. It's the culture that will guarantee failed dreams. So where we have to go is we are going to have to go to a whole new dimension, okay? Because the, the subscription that we have right now, the culture that we live in right now, it doesn't produce mastery, okay? What happens for those kids, and I'm not advocating that you become a Shaolin monk at all, but what would happen if Christians had the same level of focus and discipline that these three-year-old Shaolin uh, monk apprentices do, okay? What would happen if, if Christians had that same level of focus and discipline. I tell you what would happen is that we would flip the world upside down in a single generation. Okay, we would flip the world upside down in a single generation. All right. So say say limitless. Here we go. Um we I'm just pulling up some notes here, fam. Um, because where we have to go is to a place of mastery. So can you please start, I just drop in the comments, mastery, okay? Mastery is, in a sense, a new, uh, a new concept for a lot of Christians, right? Do you, do you have a concept that every single day you wake up fully devoted to mastering the limitless life? Right. If you were going to decide, right, we, we've talked about this decision, desire, commitment. When you're, when you're deciding to live the limitless life, what you're deciding to do is you're deciding to commit to a world, a, a life of mastery, complete devotion. What you see embodied in those three year old children is devotion. They're completely devoted, their time, their lives, they're set apart. And that's a question you're going to have to ask yourself. Hey, if 95% of people, are taking their wildest dreams to the grave, what are you going to do that's going to set you apart from the 95%? It's going to have to be something exceptional. And that thing that you're going to have to do, right, is mastery. And the thing that you're going to have to master, if you want to be a person who lives your wildest dreams, who unlocks the deepest levels of desire of your heart and unlocks the power to redesign reality in the image of heaven consistently so that your wildest dreams come alive, one after the other, one after the other, like you've never imagined, you will have to commit to mastery and you will have to pay the price of mastery. And the price of mastery is the price is devotion. Okay. Drop devotion in the comments, right? Devotion. That is the price tag. Everyone say devotion. It's another level of focus and discipline that our culture isn't used to. In fact, you know, if if someone sees you living at the level of devotion, they will be shocked. They'll be like, oh my gosh, who are you? What are you doing? They'll, they'll think that you're weird. They'll, that weird. they'll think that you're crazy. They'll think that you're bizarre. They'll think that you're outrageous. They'll say, hey, you're you're pushing it too much. And I get people saying this to me all the time. Oh yeah, you, you got to be watch out how much, uh, you know, how much you're pushing it. And I'm like, dude, I've been living with this level of intensity for over 20 years. It's actually... 
it's actually what it is, is devotion. So fam, let's look at devotion. Let's look at what we're going to have to master. What is the curriculum for the limitless life? I'm going to screen share again very quickly. And uh, just, you, you've seen this before, but I just want to show it again. Um, it's this, right? The curriculum for a limitless life. L plus CR times S7 equals a limitless life. Now this might seem simple, but what I've done, it's taken me over 20 years of pursuing the more with massive intentionality and massive intensity consistently. And now this right here, this equation for me, this is compounding returns. This is, uh, this is leverage. This is compounding returns. This is going to enable me to impact multitudes. I'm going to light the whole world up with this equation. Okay. So, this is what we have to master, leverage and compounding returns times the synergy of seven. I'm going to stop the screen share. That's what you uh, need to master. So we're going to go deeper in this today, looking at um, the areas that we have to master. Okay, so drop mastery in the comments again. That's what we're going after. All right. Um, leverage. We've talked about leverage, okay? And uh, you can probably, I would, I'd like you to try and guess this and say it before I do, but leverage, okay? Two keys to leverage, which we've talked about. The first part is specialized knowledge, okay? So if you're going to live a limitless life, you have to be a scholar, okay? You have to devote yourself to specialized knowledge. Say scholar in the comments. You're going to be devoting your life to training, devoting your life to specialized knowledge. And, uh, and on top of that, we're, you know, to combine to create leverage, you need a mechanism that can produce greater results for the same or less effort. Okay, so that's systems, systems and strategies that are going to give you that. So that's what you need. Uh, specialized knowledge plus systems and strategies, that's going to give you your leverage. Okay, and then you've got to master compounding returns. So you have to devote yourself. Okay, how can I create compounding returns? Um, the compounding returns is going to come by you taking massive, bold, passionate, precise, and strategic actions on a daily basis as you implement your leverage strategically, as you constantly refine it, increasing the efficiency, and as you implement layer upon layer of strategy and leverage over a long period of time. Okay, that sounds complex. And listen, it is complex. It's not simple. It's not basic. Um, it's not easy to live a limitless life. It requires, it will push you. It will take you where you've never been. It will require you to accomplish what you think is an impossible. And in fact, the person that you are today is not who you will be when you're living your limitless life. And that's part of the point for God is that, hey, listen, who you are right now cannot live your wildest dreams. It's not possible for who you are right now to live your wildest dreams. That's why every day we work on ourselves and we create leverage by increasing who we are. We remove every limit. We, you know, we get, we turn the tables, we flip the script on being our own worst enemy and we become our greatest asset every day. So we're doing that mastery. We're creating a masterpiece out of ourselves every day and we're creating a masterpiece out of our dreams every day. And we do that by just, listen, that the, the slow thinking, the smart, the strategic dynamic of this process is looking for leverage every day. And that, listen, we as we master this process, we talked about the big three yesterday, right? Uh, the big three is how we get everything we've ever desired. The spiritual art of dreaming, we let our hearts loose like never before. We dream, and not just every now and then, every single day we're dreaming beyond what we've ever dreamed before. Here's a quote for you. Live every day like all your wildest dreams have already come true. Oh, God gave me that years ago and I've loved it and I've enjoyed it. But it's only in the last, you know, only recently that I've fully discovered and understood and experienced the power of what it means to live every day like all your wildest dreams have already come true. You know, in our last session, I talked about yada that we go into a place where we have intimate experiential knowledge of our dreams. But when you have intimate experiential knowledge of your dreams, what happens is your brain can't tell the difference between what is real and what is imagined. So all these emotions go, like when your brain 
see you know, like experiences you imagining your wildest dreams coming alive when your brain's there it's like oh my gosh wow your brain thinks that's happening for real and it releases all these chemicals as though it's actually happening in real life oh my gosh this dream is alive oh my gosh this dream is happening that's actually how you live every day like all your wildest dreams have already come true is because you enjoy them right shamelessly enjoy your wildest dreams in the spirit every day don't go and visit your dreams every now and then every day like intentionally dreaming enjoy it be a daydreamer who enjoys their dreams licking your dreams until you're white hot with a fever of desire every day like throughout the day hey if you're not on fire go and lick your dreams some more until you're absolutely raging on fire and enjoy it right shamelessly enjoy your wildest dreams in the spirit as you're imagining them shameless enjoyment go wow let the full emotion wash over you that's raw uh, re reality redesigning power being stoked on the inside of you you're you're building in the spirit in this process uh, that's <laughs> and then out of that place right blueprint strategies uh downloads from heaven they're all going to start coming as you go wow yes and the as the intellectual art of dreaming kicks in for you and you're going planning you know like this you know my whiteboard it's like full of planning every day i'm seeing my plans my dreams my strategies it's all happening there i'm meditating on it i'm seeing it i'm living it I'm like wow all day every day and then and then right you can just go straight in bold passionate strategic actions because you are you know you've got so much clarity so much focus so much precision you are like a laser with the precision like a just woo, you're like a hot knife through butter you're an unstoppable force yeah so those are the first three elements that we must develop mastery of okay we can't just have a go at them you've got to be able to teach it, okay? You've got to be able to live it. You've got to be able to teach it. You've got to be able to carry it. You've got to be able to impart it, a level of mastery, okay? You are becoming a master. And I want you to say this, I am becoming a master, all right? You are becoming a master. You yourself are being trained to train. You yourself are being equipped to equip. You yourself are becoming, uh, you know, uh, a master of this process. We're going to impart it to others. So the mastery goes beyond that, all right? The mastery goes on to, we've got those four other areas. And listen, when, when with this limitless, you know, the curriculum for the limitless life, apart from learning to read and write, what I'm sharing with you right now, there's nothing more important to learn in life, period. It's just a systematic breakdown for you and there, there isn't anything more important to learn in life than what's in, encapsulated in the limitless curriculum. Those three things there, after you've learned to kind of read and write, and you know, even that's debatable, that I would say is pretty important. It's going to help you in this process. But even if you didn't know how to read and write, this is this is even more important than that. It's mastery of the art, you know, the spiritual art of dreaming, the intellectual art of dreaming, and the practical art of dreaming, that will that will give you whatever you want in life, okay? And then there's the next four, okay? Because there's seven topics in the curriculum for the limitless life, the spiritual art of dreaming, the uh, intellectual art of dreaming, the practical art of dreaming, and then the next one is identity, drop identity, and then relationships, and then physical health, and finances. Right there, that is the curriculum for the limitless life, and those are the areas that you're going to have to devote yourself to mastering. All right, who's going to be a master drop? I'm going to be a master if you believe you are. I believe that you are here because God's calling you out to become a master of this. And this might be the very beginning of your journey, but don't worry. You're going to go along making progress, but that's where you're going. You're going to become a master in this space. Right. Um let me share another couple of story, uh, fun stories with you. I was in Indonesia a few years ago and met some cool per people. One guy that I met in Indonesia, he was planting a big forest, pretty big forest, okay? This was his goal. He wanted to plant a big forest. And his strategy for planting this big forest, his strategy was in phase one, he, he was employing 30, not, 30, not just 30, 30,000 people 
for the first stage of planting this forest? <laughs> Drop that in the comments, 30,000. That was, he was employing 30,000 people for phase one on his project. Pretty massive, right, of reforestation in Indonesia. That's huge. Holy moly. How did he come to that point? He's a Christian billionaire in Jakarta. How did he come to that point? Well, listen, he came to that point by applying the principles that we're talking about today. He actually got there you know, through leverage and compounding returns leverage and compounding returns gave him that capacity do you think it's worth developing some mastery so you come to the point where you create that type of leverage and compounding returns that can actually enable you to live your wildest dreams on that trip i was actually with some friends um and we drove into this city and as we drove into the city the cars that we were in the city set upon uh, just out of jakarta and someone started you know people started saluting the car and i'm like oh why why are people saluting the car and I knew I was with some, you know, quite lovely ladies that I was there, but I didn't realize who I was with. So one of the ladies in the car, her name's Lisa, she, they said, oh, it's Lisa's city. And I was like, well, what do you mean it's Lisa's city? And they're like, no, it's her city. She built that city from the ground up, the entire thing. She has a building company and they build 10,000 houses a year. Holy moly, what is that? That's leverage and compounding returns. Again, she's another... Christian billionaire, and uh, it was just phenomenal what she had created. In fact, up until that date, it was the only city in Jakarta that didn't have a mo uh, in Indonesia, which is the the largest Muslim country in the world, was the only city in Indonesia at that point that didn't have a mosque in it. And when you drove into the city, the traffic was completely different. The atmosphere was completely different. When you drove into the city, all the traffic was calm, relaxed, uh, behaved nicely. When you left the city, it's back to kind of uh, Jakarta chaos if you experience jakarta tra traffic you will understand so the journey that we're on of developing mastery in these areas is absolutely worth it so let me just talk about some of the benefits for you of developing mastery in the area of identity and so uh, we've got identity relationships physical health and finances. These are the four that we're going to just touch on today. Uh, as we, you know, we'll be, we won't be too much longer in this session, but we will touch, we will touch on these four, um, because the the whole dynamic of a limitless life is that it's balanced. It's shalom. Everything functioning according to divine design. If you really want shalom, you've got. To, uh, if you really want the limitless life, it has to be the balance. So the first three, the big three, they are the number one keys to getting whatever you want. Um, and you could use those. And a lot of wealthy people use those keys. Actually, if you look at a lot of really wealthy people, they use those principles to build wealth, to build vast fortunes, to build empires. They use those three uh, three keys that I've shared with you. But they, you know, that's how you get wealthy billionaires who end up committing suicide because they don't have the power of the synergy of seven, right? So they, they've got, they've created a massive amount of leverage and compounding returns, but they haven't created a limitless life. And that's not what we were after. We're not just after creating wealth. We're after, after a limitless life. And you have to incorporate the power of the synergy of seven because the synergy of seven is where, you know, synergy is where you get, you know, one plus one equals more than two. So you start getting explosive results that can't be attained in any other way when you get the synergy of the spiritual art of dreaming, the intellectual art of dreaming, the practical art of dreaming, identity, relationships, your physical health, and your finances all uh, dancing together, uh, empowered by leverage and compounding returns. You take all the limits off. This is the curriculum for a limitless life. So let's check out some of the benefits of mastering identity. I'm going to say for myself, right, in my personal journey in, you know, as a Christian, so my parents were missionaries for World Vision in Indonesia. I was born in the jungle in Indonesia at a very young age, I might add. And, you know, when my parents came back to New Zealand when I was two years old, they spent eight years there, but they came back to New Zealand when I was two. Uh, they became pastors. My whole life was in the church. My first job was uh, working for a church. Um, after that, I've uh, done lead missions and pastors and all sorts of ministry stuff. My whole life, that's where I've been. But within the church, the biggest struggle in the church is an identity crisis. 
And guess what the biggest struggle in the whole world is? An identity crisis. The majority of our issues on the planet, in the church, they come from an identity crisis. And so I actually devoted like over a decade of my life into studying sonship, studying identity, studying the psychology of identity, studying what Jesus says about identity, studying what the Bible says about identity, looking at it, working with people, seeing massive transformation in people's lives, implementing um, you know, the implementing the psychology of sonship, the psychology of identity in people's lives and seeing radical transformations, fast track transformations that people hadn't been able to experience anywhere else. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're onto something. And so listen, what I've done is I've gone and cr- I, I have paved the way for a lot of people in identity because I spent over a decade studying it, go, getting my head around it, going through the theology of it, studying over 2000 years of church theology and how they talked about uh, theology throughout the centuries and, and, and who it worked for and who it didn't work for. And so uh, what I've created is there's so much resource and training available for you on sonship, on identity, which you're not going to have to go and do that. It's actually prepared for you to fast track your process into mastery right those Shaolin monks right who are they're three years old they're going through it well they didn't have to invent kung fu right they've got a blueprint there they're like ta-da they can go through it what I've done is actually helped create a blueprint for you how you can fast track mastering identity let me know if that sounds good um, to be able to fast track drop fast track in the comments if that sounds like a good deal so identity is so massive. It's this is um, this is going to have one of the biggest impacts to every part of your life uh, of, of anything there is. Okay, it's just got, it's just huge. Okay, and here's my definition of what mature sonship looks like. Um, mature sonship is the ability to receive divine love perfectly, and the ability to give perfect expression to divine love. <laughs> I'll say it again. Mature sonship is the ability to give per, to receive divine love perfectly and give perfect expression to divine love. Oh my gosh. Do you think that's something that's worth mastering? Just imagine that. Just imagine if you could receive divine love perfectly and there was absolutely nothing whatsoever that created any restriction in your capacity to receive divine love straight from the Trinity. So you could be immersed in a baptism and just live in a baptism of divine love 24 seven and give perfect expression to that. Nothing in you restricting or inhibiting this divine flow of love. So, uh, you know, in the divine dance, it's the father, the son and the Holy spirit, each expressing divine love perfectly and each receiving divine love perfectly. And one of the reasons they made you in their image is so that you would be made of the exact same substance so that you could be a conduit so that you would have the same, the same ability to receive and express love that they do so that you could fit perfectly into the divine dance so that you could mesh perfectly as one substance with the Trinity so that you could receive divine love perfectly and express divine love perfectly. You're made in the image of God. You're made of the same substance. Oh my gosh. And when you walk, step into your identity, there's nothing whatsoever that creates any form of separation. Uh, there's nothing that restricts your capacity to experience and enjoy the wonder and of oneness and the ecstasy and bliss of seamless union with the Trinity. Whoa, ho, ho, ho. how much power do you think that would bring into your life if you could live like that every single day? This, this Mastering identity puts you into a place where you receive effortless divine bliss and ecstasy anytime you want it. As easy as breathing, you can immerse yourself in a baptism of absolute ecstasy and bliss. Wow. Does that sound like a benefit? Does that sound like there's some good reason to uh, develop mastery there? Um, so here's some benefits of identity. Seamless union with the Trinity. It's absolute seamless union with the Trinity. Um, perpetual conversation, right? Seamless intimacy, just a constant conversation. A divine state of being, which is John 8, 12, what we talked about there. Um you know, the ability to receive divine love perfectly and give perfect expression to divine love. Who wouldn't want that intimacy, dominion, right? 
um, dominion, to rule and reign over storms. Holy moly, Jesus. And listen, what does this look like? It looks like Jesus. It, Jesus demonstrated what it looks like. Uh, let me give a, just something, say something. Jesus is an example, isn't an example for us, right? He's not just an example for us. He's an example of us. Let me say it again. Jesus isn't just an example for us. He's an example of us. When we discover who we truly are, we realize that, you know, to be made in the image of God is we are an echo. We are a mirror image of God. That's who we truly are. So when we look at Jesus, we see a reflection of ourselves. <laughs> Jesus isn't just an example for us. He's an example of us to help us awaken to the present reality of who we truly are, what sonship really looks like and what the normal Christian life was designed to be. Say divine design. It's a glorious thing. Um, and, you know, when you live in sonship, there's a faith that comes from intimacy that fast tracks your capacity to redesign reality. Listen, Jesus spoke, uh, you know, just... Just Jesus, his intention was enough to turn water into wine. He didn't even pray over the wine. He might have like waved his hand over it. But Jesus Jesus was easily able to re redesign reality wherever he went, right? There's someone blind, boom, he, he redesigns reality and their eyes open. There's someone dead, he releases resurrection power, redesigns their reality, and now they're alive, right? There's, uh, <clears throat> there's a storm, he redesigns reality by ruling over the storm. Peace be calm. Woo! These are the benefits of identity. Um, supernatural power, supernatural knowledge, supernatural wisdom, supernatural revelation and understanding, um, divine health, supernatural might, you know, like Samson had picked up the gates of a city. Woo! Come on. Uh, supernatural favor, divine appointment and the momentum of heaven coming upon your life. Do you think, do you understand that that's leverage and compounding returns there? Holy moly, the leverage um, of, of walking in your identity is insane, right? It, um, and the energy, right? The, the energy that releases simply by not dealing with negative emotions because you're baptized in love and bliss and ecstasy. Can you imagine just the difference in how much energy you have? Processing negative emotions uses a lot of energy. I, um, I, always want to check my attitude really, really carefully and keep it on point and keep myself really accountable with my attitude because my attitude, if I'm not careful, could step me into negative emotions, which it just drains your state of being, drains your energy. And there's no need to live there when you could be living in ecstasy and bliss. Oh, so good. And when you discover and you master identity, you master emotions, you master psychology, uh, you master your entire state of being. This is, this is a wild space. Let me know if you think that shifting from the crisis space of identity that the church is in to a place of mastery would completely flip the church upside down and set the world on fire. I believe that with my whole heart. Um, so this is huge. So uh, mastery there, do you think that that's going to add some value to the synergy of seven? Come on, I believe it does. Uh, and it will. Um, one other thing as well about identity, okay, for you is that when it comes to identity, um, who's got a phone? Let me know if you've got a phone. Uh, you know, wave it around, drop a photo of it. In the uh, it's hard to drop a photo of your phone, but just drop, yep, I've got a phone. If you've got a Samsung or an iPhone, drop Samsung or iPhone or whatever type of phone you've got. Um, who's got apps, right? If you've got a favorite app, let me know. Coming soon, fam, coming soon. This app here will be your favorite. Um, it's not ready for release yet, but it's the Raising Royalty app, and soon it will be your favorite app on your phone um, because it's going to have your journey uh, into the limitless life uh, right there. So the thing is, right, you've got apps and you have operating systems on your phone. Now, if the operating system isn't functioning according to its design, all the apps will malfunction, right? Well, in life, most people just talk about apps, right? And even in ministry and even in the church, most people think that more apps are the solution, right? Prophecy is an app that you download, okay? Um, the laying on of hands, healing, words of knowledge, all of those things, those are apps, okay? Deliverance, that's an app that you can download. And it takes only a moment, right? It's just, it's an app. Beautiful app, great app. So is becoming a lawyer, that's an app. So is becoming a plumber, that's an app. All of these skills, those are an app, but the thing that determines 
the functionality of the app is the operating system, okay? And if the operating system is not functioning according to divine design, all the apps will malfunction. So if you've got an identity crisis going on, your parenting app is going to malfunction. Um, you know, your relationship app is going to malfunction. Your ability to receive divine love and give perfect expression to divine love is going to malfunction. Your intimacy, your connection with God, that's going to malfunction. Your ability to hear clearly from God, maybe that's going to malfunction. Your ability to take bold, passionate, precise, strategic actions every day, uh, you know, consistently, that is going to malfunction. Everything's going to malfunction if your operating system isn't uh operating according to divine design and that's your identity and that's the benefit of mastering your identity is that all your apps will start to function according to divine design instead of glitching out all the time when i you know it was uh early days of ministry so excited about supernatural uh breakouts and i'd spent you know i spent nearly six years praying and fasting and asking god to you know set me free from religion and powerless christianity and finally got this breakthrough into signs and wonders and miracles. And we're seeing young people out on the streets and young people on missions and hundreds of miracles breaking out all around us, but still seeing young people depressed, still seeing them struggle with integrity, uh, still seeing them having eating disorders and mental health issues and, uh, you know, uh, and bad relationships. And what's going on? There was something deeper, right? Empowering them with supernatural ministry apps wasn't the solution. That's a great thing. But the real thing that they needed was we needed to resolve the identity crisis. And that's why I plunged myself into mastering identity and sonship is because that was the core issue of humanity. We master identity. Other things are all going to start panning out. Let me know if you think that should be a priority, right? Um, I think it should be a priority. But is your education system teaching how to master sonship and identity? No. Uh, is there a is there a very clear process and protocol that you can follow of how to master sonship and master your identity? Um, you know, where do you go for that? <laughs> it's so rare. And listen, I, I hear a lot of people talking about sonship and I listen to what they're saying and I call it plastic sonship, right? Because they're talking sonship, but they're still living an orphan life. And they've just heard that other people are using the language of sonship. And so essentially what they've done is, you know, They've gotten like, oh, yeah, sonship sounds like it's popular. And they got the sonship label and they just put it on the old orphan bottle. It's still the orphan wine they're drinking. Mm. But they're selling it as sonship and it's not sonship. And it's very, very rare to find anyone who will take you through a systematic journey of discovering sonship. So identity, boom, put that at the top of the list. Major priority. Okay, next one is, um, is relationships. Here's a crazy thing about relationships, right? And about heaven and this bringing heaven to earth. If you look at heaven and the foundation, so we've shifted from identity now, we're talking about our next bullet point, which is relationships. But if you look at the actual foundation of heaven, what you're going to find there is at the very core of heaven is a relationship. Right? At the very core of heaven, you've got the divine dance. You've got the fellowship of the Trinity. You've got perichoresis. You've got um, the father and the son pouring out perfect divine love on the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit and the son lavishing the father and perfect divine love and the father and the spirit lavishing perfect divine love on Jesus. And that right there, that is the very foundation of heaven. It's an unbroken cycle of divine love that at the, at its at its core, that is what heaven is. It's the fellowship of the Trinity. It's the divine dance. Heaven isn't about, you know, angels and fluffy ducks. Now there's a beautiful dynamic of heaven, all the creativity and the atmosphere and the wonder, but all of that emanates off, radiates off the divine dance, off the fellowship of the Trinity. So if we want to create authentic expressions of heaven on earth, where it starts is in relationship, right? It starts in us creating relationships that are a mirror image of the fellowship of the Trinity, creating relationships that are a mirror image of the divine dance. So, uh, so you know, in churches, it should be a mirror image of the divine dance. In our families, it should be a mirror image of the divine dance. If we have devoted our lives to bringing heaven to earth primarily it must be expressed in our relationships one with another and that's uh so a massive tragedy of our era is that 
We have people that, you know, building massive ministries, you know, whoa, got all these big ministries going on, ministries happening. Yay. Wow. This is amazing. Look at all these ministries. That's great. But listen, in the midst of it, scandal, in the midst of it, heartbreak, in the midst of it, abuse, in the midst of it, affairs, in the midst of it, chaos, not a mirror image of the Trinity. So we can be impacting hundreds of thousands of people, building massive buildings, building massive movements, but not one single authentic expression of heaven on earth in the midst of it. And the reason for that is a massive identity crisis, which is causing everyone's relationship apps to malfunction and people aren't taking care of the root cause, which is identity. You'll never resolve relationship uh, dysfunction and, and cultural issues without ide addressing identity first and the church has not made identity a priority by a long shot. And the identity that it does teach, I would say, in my opinion, after having spent well over a decade, decade getting free from the identity training that I had in church, which actually just gave me issues, uh, made me completely dysfunctional, made me hate myself, uh, put shame inside of me, which is a toxic substance, left me as a spiritual schizophrenic. I can say and testify that the, the identity training that I had in the church was an absolute burden. It took me a long time to get free of it and discover sonship. And it's a tragedy on the planet that churches aren't making sonship theology an absolute priority, but it, it's, uh, it's not popular in churches, so they don't do it. So relationships, what's the benefit in mastering relationships? Well, first of all, you, if you want to master relationships, you better master identity. It's not going to happen otherwise. But heaven is the fellowship of the Trinity. So there's no capacity to establish heaven on earth outside of a perfect expression of the divine dance. So one of the first benefits, which is huge of mastering relationships, is that we'll actually be able to start to create communities which are an authentic expression of heaven on earth. Whoa, mic drop moment. Wouldn't that be good if, that if our churches were authentic expressions of heaven on earth? Shouldn't that be a priority? Don't you think that's some leverage? Don't you think there's some compounding returns that would come from that if we created communities that were a mirror image of heaven on earth because of the unbroken cycles of divine love that were expressed one to another? Can you imagine instead of people having all these stories of tragedy and heartbreak from the experience of church, just getting swallowed up in the divine dance just by going to church? Holy moly, fam, there's so much power in this. Um, you know, compounding returns of getting relationships right includes um, our quality of life. Oh my gosh. And oftentimes life is measured um, in the quality of our relationships. You know, don't you feel good about life when you're feeling most loved, you're feeling most connected, when you're feeling most heard, and when you're feeling like you've been able to love people deeply and you feel that connection? Isn't life beautiful and sweet? The world could be falling apart, right? But if you've got the sweetness of the fellowship of the Trinity expressed in this authentic community, oh my gosh, family, there's nothing like it. Um, you know, there's the benefits of uh, of love, connection, friendship, and how lives get impacted so powerfully, so deeply, so sweetly, the depth of impact when people encounter genuine, pure love and get swallowed up in communities that are authentic expressions of the divine dance. Wow, the depth of transformation and impact that takes place is wild. Um, it's in the context of relationship that you can exp express and develop leadership and I want everyone just to drop leadership in the comments, okay? Um, leadership, holy moly, family. Leadership gives you uh, limitless, there's limitless, limitless, limitless leverage and compounding returns waiting for you by developing your leadership skills. So we develop leadership skills, boom, your impact on the planet can just get multiplied exponentially. This was one of the secrets of the Clapham Saints was leadership skills were phenomenal, right? That's part of the relationship dynamic. How you, you know, how you relate to people that de will determine how much leadership you'll have in their lives. Um, you know, and listen, in, in the context of relationship and serving one another, that's where destiny takes place. Destiny is service. Leadership is service. Um, there's a saying, your network is your net worth. Now, it's not about, you know, um, turning people into dollar signs, but your network is your net worth. There's so much leverage, so much impact can happen when you're great at building relationships rather than burning bridges. 
who would you rather be? The person who builds bridges everywhere they go or the person who everywhere you go, it's just like, shing, just connecting deeply with people's hearts everywhere you go. Beautiful relationships. Oh my gosh. Uh, you're just everywhere you go. People want to be with you. They have fallen in love with you and it's genuine. It's true. It's deep. It's rich. Oh my gosh, family. That is so beautiful. So priceless. Um, there's, and then imagine, you know, the chain reactions of love right? The chain reactions of love that come off your life as you're touching people with love. Oh my gosh, this is, it just goes on and on. This is infinite, right? The infinite possibilities of Christ start opening up for us when we master relationships. That has got to be, right, on the, on like the top priority of what you learn on the planet. Listen, if there's a, every single university should be teaching the curriculum for a limitless life every school should be teaching it every family should be teaching it every church should be teaching it this should be everywhere the curriculum for a limitless life should be everywhere you should be mastering it you should be teaching it this is how the kingdom will expand will advance okay priorities family let me know if you think that this should be a priority mastering relationships the next one physical health ha <laughs> ha um, I think that Christians have a lot of struggle with this. Um, I've been to a lot of pastors meetings where, you know, you're sitting in a circle with all these other pastors and I'm like, man, someone should have handed out protective eyewear at the, um, you know, at the door when we came in here because we're sitting there and all these shirts are under so much tension from these massive bellies that at any second, one of those buttons might pop and shoo, fly across the room and boom, pop somebody's eyeball out because these shirts are under so much pressure because there's so many obese pastors. And I'm like, this is a hazard. You've set us all in a circle. Some, one of these buttons is going to pop someone's eye out. Um, and, uh, and sometimes I make a joke of it, but to me, this is not funny, right? To me, this is not good leadership. We've got to go way beyond this. We need a space of like mastering physical health. In fact, one of the first times I ever went to Promise Keepers, which is one of the biggest conferences in New Zealand uh, for men, um, is um, they were talking about how many pastors and leaders are dying prematurely from heart disease, right? Just dying from obesity. Oh my gosh, family, this is terrible. We're in an obesity epidemic. So um, there's so many health issues, right? So physical health, mastering physical health is going to give you leverage. It's going to give you count compounding returns. How? Listen, your length of life, compounding returns depends on how long you are alive right? So physical health, if you die, boom, that's the end. You know, like you're not getting, you're not maxing out on the compounding returns that you have if you're dead. There are some systems that can, you know, be multi-generational, which are great and we'll talk about them, but um, <laughs> you're not maxing out, right? Your quality of life, the level of energy that you have, you can turn up and burn up because you're absolutely on fire. So Quality of life is a big deal as well, right? When you, where, wherever you go, you're on fire. You, you know, the classic, you're living your best life. Yes, you're thriving. Yes, you're radiating. Um, you know, you're getting fitter, faster and stronger. Um, it gives you massive mental clarity and your emotions are thriving and your chemical game's on point. Um, you know, you can do all the adventures, all the sports, all the expeditions that you want. I want to like reach more unreached villages. I love that. And it's actually like, by mastering this, there's I think believe there's an invitation to become a superhuman, right? There's an invitation to take off the limits in every area of our lives. So physical health is a massive opportunity for that. So let me know if you think that should be a priority. I think it should be a priority, right? And listen, if we want to master that, hey, what are we going to have to do? I th you know, we're going to have to, um, there's a lot of things that we're going to have to discover and master. We're going to have to master light, okay? We're going to have to master light. We're going to have to master breathing we're going to have to master water we're going to have to uh, master movement we're going to have to master uh food we're going to have to master nutrition and when i say food not just what we're eating how we're producing it where it's coming from um we're gonna have to master nutrition what we're what we're eating there's so many elements right that we're invited into to have massive breakthrough and there's so many options and and open doors for us to start getting massive gains there's low hanging fruit in the area of physical health but um the level of energy that you live with right and how much sleep do you and that's the that's the last one as well you have to master sleep okay um there's seven things there that we have to master in the area of uh physical health right our relationship with light with water with breath with um 
with movement, with food, with nutrition, and with sleep. We have to master these things. There's the low hanging fruit. But listen, the level of energy that you live with is going to determine how much you can achieve in a day. Imagine if you have twice as much energy and the, the way to get twice as much energy was actually way easier than you imagined. What if there was low hanging fruit just begging for you to double your energy? That means you could get twice as much done in a day, twice as much done in a week. That doesn't mean that you get twice as much done in a month. It means you get much more done in a month because of the power of synergy and compounding returns. So now all of a sudden, each month, there's an exponential increase in what you're achieving and what you're getting done. People say to me all the time, Look, how, how are you doing all this stuff? Where, where, where do you get your energy from? And, and there is so much leverage and so much capacity to develop compounding returns through mastery of your physical health. So I believe that should be a priority. Let me know if you think that should be a priority, not just something you like. Most churches, most Christians, oh, it's kind of not a big deal. It's a big deal, right? The length of your days are determined by your physical health, the quality of your days, the energy that you have. Are you going to absolutely be on fire and be fully present? You know, like not turning up somewhere half asleep, not turning up somewhere disengaged because you're sick, not turning up somewhere like, oh, I can't do that. No, you're absolute. You're thriving. You're pushing the limits. You're going where you've never gone before. And um, that's what I'm trying to do physically for myself. I'm like, I'm going, I'm breaking boundaries. I'm removing limits on my physical health at every stage, every opportunity. I get to remove a limit. I'm like, yeah, let's take that limit off. Let's go where we've never gone before. All right, fam. Next one. Last one for today. Finances. <laughs> oh, imagine if you were that guy in Indonesia where you just had the ability tomorrow, if you wanted to, to employ 30,000 people. Imagine if you had the ability to build 10,000 buildings a year. Imagine if you had the ability to build your own entire city from the ground up, just turn bare land into a city. Why? Because you had the funding to do it. Does that does that sound like some leverage and some power for compounding returns? Um, a good friend of mine, Bruce McDonald, he's got a quote I love. Uh, many people say this, but I love it. And he's, he's someone that made it famous in my life is that uh, money is a terrible master, but a wonderful servant. And there's four ways that you can use money. You can give it, right? You can save it, you can invest it, or you can spend it. But do you think that's going to give you leverage? Do you think that's going to give you compounding returns? I mean, one of the most important functions of money is to make more money. And when you've got an abundance of money, that money by itself can go out and make more money. We looked at the compounding interest calculator. Uh, let me do a quick screen share with you again. Who thinks that it would be great to turn $1,000 into $100 million while you're sleeping? Well, let me show you the calculation of how it's possible to turn $1,000 into $100 million while you're sleeping. Okay, so this is it right here. $1,000 initial investment, put it in for your grandchild, right? Change your whole family line forever. Put $1,000 in. If you can get a 5% monthly interest rate in 10 years, let's calculate it. Uh, sorry, 20 years. $121 million, dollars $131,739,573.74. $131, Who thinks that that might change your family line if you had over $100 million? Right? If you had that, uh, if that came into your world, do you think that would change your family line? Let me post this in the comments here, that, that amount of money. $121 million, uh, $121,739,573.74. That you, by the power of compounding returns, you could create that money in your sleep. If you could get what? Leverage. What's the leverage? The system, right? Specialized knowledge and a system, and then the compounding returns is implement the leverage, implement the system consistently over a long period of time and add layers of strategy at every opportunity. So possible, fam, for us to completely redesign reality, completely redesign our lives. Um, money is a massive part of it. And if we can master money, we can take limits off our lives like never before. Uh, I want to pull up one crazy verse uh, for you from Ecclesiastes that you might think, holy moly, how did that even get in the Bible, right? Um, 
I'm just going to pull it up for you one second. This by this verse, you'll be like, holy moly, how, how is this even in the Bible? Ecclesiastes 10:19. Uh, and it says, a feast is made for laughter, wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. Let me say that again. This is crazy. A feast is made for laughter, wine makes life merry, and money is the answer for everything. Oh my goodness. How did that sneak into the Bible? Um, <laughs> crazy, right? But from Solomon's perspective, he understood, hey, look, if you've got, uh, I've got some money, I could probably help you. Do you think that money can be helpful? I believe it can. I believe that money can give us leverage. Money can create compounding returns. Uh, if you don't want your money, I'll more than happily take it, invest it, and create compounding returns. That leaves a legacy of blessing for generations to come. Do you believe that we've got an invitation, an opportunity to step into mastery? We're going to wrap it up with this right here, guys. But there is, we have been invited to create a masterpiece out of our lives. And the way that we're going to create a masterpiece out of our lives is through the curriculum for the limitless life. We have to unsubscribe to all the other junk, rubbish, average uh, thinking and ideologies that are out there. And we're going to have to subscribe to the curriculum that produces the limitless life. And we can't do it casually. We've got to have that Shaolin monk approach of focus and discipline where we're willing to do whatever it takes, willing to pay whatever it costs. And the question for you is, what are you willing to commit to live the limitless life? The curriculum for a limitless life, the spiritual art of dreaming, the intellectual art of dreaming, the practical art of dreaming, identity, relationships, physical health, finances, that right there is the curriculum for a limitless life. And that is the journey that we are on together. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A in our next session. We're going to go deep. We'll share more testimony. Uh, that'll be 2 p.m. Uh, tomorrow if you're joining us live. Otherwise, it's just the next one in the series. So in that next session, we're going to get to uh, ask you know, more questions, talk more about this. I'll share more testimonies. Um, share a little bit more of my story and just kind of have a really good time to connect, um, let our hearts together, uh, you know, really let our hearts come together. So what will you decide? What will you desire? What will you commit? And let me ask you on a scale of one to 10, one being the least, 10 being the highest, how committed are you to living the limitless life? And let's jump into our imagination for a moment. And I want you to imagine you're in this place, you're standing with Jesus and you're looking back over your life. And I want you to imagine having this conversation going, Jesus, I'm so glad that all those, all those years ago, back in the, you know, the 22nd of February, <laughs> Wednesday, the 22nd of February, New Zealand time, 2023, I decided to go all in on mastering the limitless life. As you look back on a life that has lived your wildest dreams, absolutely to the fullest lived out your wildest dreams because you mastered the curriculum for the limitless life. Papa, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I ask that in this place as we dream with you, you will unlock the vault of our heart's desires in unprecedented ways, that you would take us into the realm that is infinitely beyond what we've ever did to pray, ask, think, dream, or even imagine. Holy Spirit, would you take the keys and would you unlock uh, those dimensions of our heart that have been locked up and bound up by negative experiences and lies and limiting beliefs or would you unlock us to dream like never before we give you all the glory and all the honor in jesus name amen fam i love you i saw an angel in the marble and i carved until i set it free every day you get to create a masterpiece out of your <laughs> self and out of your dreams may they bring glory to god and may they impact the world as they're a gift for humanity. May they create a legacy of blessing for generations to come. Love you, bless you, and we'll see you in uh, our next session. Bye-bye, fam.